It's 931. I think we'll get started. Um, just want to confirm that all of us are here. Commissioner Cameron, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am here. And Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. Good morning. Good morning. And Commissioner Zuniga. Good morning, everyone. I'm here. And today, um, really the last full day of the state of emergency declared by Governor Baker last year in March, um, we are um, able to enjoy continued um, um, benefit of the virtual connectivity so that we can meet in this fashion today under an executive order that the governor issued last March as well. Um, be before we get started, call to order the meeting. Um, today is Monday, June 14th. It is just 9.32 a.m. and it's a public meeting 347. Commissioners who have been here from day one, you are approaching 350. So um, this is a big number. Before we get started, I do have a few prepared remarks, um, if you'll allow me. And then um, we do have a busy day ahead. First off, happy Flag Day to all. This coming Friday, the MGC will honor a new state holiday that formally recognizes the historic significance of June 19, 1865 when more than 250 enslaved black people in Texas were finally freed by executive decree over two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation took effect and nearly one half year after the 13th Amendment was ratified. For those newly freed individuals, this day became known as Juneteenth. While nearly all states recognize Juneteenth, our Director of Diversity and Legislative Affairs, Jill Griffin, wanted me to emphasize that few have adopted this day, also known as Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, and Emancipation Day, as an official state holiday. On June 19 last year, Governor Baker declared Juneteenth a Massachusetts state holiday in an official proclamation, stating that well, Juneteenth is an opportunity to recommit ourselves to the goal of creating a more equal and just society, an effort that continues today, unquote. On July 24th last year, that proclamation became law when the governor signed the state legislature's bill designating Juneteenth Independence Day as an annual state holiday. And consistent with this commission's commitment to intentionally promote and expand racial and cultural awareness and appreciation within the MGC, our equity and inclusion group will be following up internally on this special day of celebration. We also have other reasons to celebrate. I want to acknowledge two significant promotions within the Massachusetts State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit. Our commanding officer, Captain Brian Connors was promoted to detective captain effective yesterday. Brian started with the MGC's formation and built the team to the robust unit that we know today, the 24 seven onsite presence at all three casinos, the investigative group in our Boston office and the racing division troopers. Distinguished by his integrity and dedication, we have been more than fortunate to have detective Captain Connors in this leadership position. Commissioners, Brian is not able to join us today, although I pleaded with him last night, but he did have to report this morning early to headquarters and he has promised to join us for public recognition at a later date. And I have a sense that we will probably be celebrating with him in a less public fashion in the near future. While our loss is now the Commonwealth's gain, we do have very excited relating, related news, excuse me. Please join me in congratulating our very own Michael Banks. Mike was promoted to captain effective yesterday and assumes the unit commander's position of the GEU. Mike, as you know, comes with prior experience as a homicide investigator at the Middlesex DA's office and has earned his JD. We'll have a lot in common there. You've got a few other attorneys, Mike, to work with. And he ascended up the ranks with the GEU swiftly 
the MGC is very fortunate that he'll continue to be a valued member of our team. His expertise, professionalism, character, and affable nature will ensure a seamless transition. Captain Banks has joined our public meeting today. Mike, I'm looking for you now. Do I see you? Can you give a wave? There you are. Um, Mike, I look forward to your leadership starting today and throughout the years ahead. And I'm going to turn now to my fellow commissioners who I know will want to join me in congratulating you and the, before we get started with our busy Monday morning agenda. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, first, I'd like to say that um, I know Brian is not with us, but Detective Captain Connors, um, we really wouldn't be in the same place that we are, have the reputation we're lucky enough to have without his leadership in the state police. And I know all the G. EU members um, will, will be nodding their heads when I say that. Brian's leadership was amazing. He represents the best. I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with hundreds and hundreds of troopers over the years in two different organizations, and Brian represents the best. I can't speak highly enough about him. Uh, but I'll save those remarks till when I see him. Um, and you know, fortunately for me, and, I, and I'm really serious when I say fortunately, I have had the opportunity to have um, not work directly with Captain Banks, but certainly get to know him, pop down to the office, um, share conversations and learn about his character, his commitment, um, and just how much he cares about doing the job the right way. So it gives me great comfort to know that he will be leading our team because I really do believe um, we will be in excellent hands and that's, not only the work, but but the character of Captain Banks, which is really, really important. So um, I wanna welcome him and I know that um, he'll do an excellent job uh, leading, leading the team. Thanks, Commissioner Cameron. Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, just to, uh, to say the same, uh, I feel uh, really happy and it's a great occasion to have two great deserved promotions um, to very distinguished careers that will continue as, as uh, Chair Judge Stein says, the loss of uh, uh, Captain Connors is the Commonwealth's gain as he moves on uh, to continue his leadership. But um, we're really grateful to have Mike, Captain Banks, uh, take the leadership um, and fill those shoes as I'm sure he'll be able to uh, following uh, Captain Connors. So look forward to continue the work and, 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 and the great um, uh, uh, you know, leadership and, and, and reputation uh, as, as Gail was mentioning and congratulations to both. And Commissioner O'Brien. Thank you, Commissioner Zemeka. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Um, so I have been fortunate to work with both um, Captain Connors and Captain Banks. Um, I'm dating myself somewhat, but worked with um, overlap with Brian in both Middlesex and the AG's office. And I, I will save most of my remarks when we formally say goodbye to him, but he is the best of the best. I remember being spoiled because my entry into being a prosecutor was dealing with the likes of Brian Connors. Um, so when that's your expectation, um, it's, a, it's a pretty high one and he's had a pretty high bar. Um, he will do well, I'm sure, in a position that he is in. Um, and I actually, I think Mike will do great as well. I actually worked with Mike when he was just an ADA. Uh, before he became a trooper, way back when in Middlesex. Um, he's got that experience in addition to all the experience on state police. So I'm sure uh, he'll do a great job and we're in good hands as well with Mike. So I congratulate both of them um, and I look forward to working with Mike as well. Good morning, Captain Banks. Would you like to make, say good morning and any add any other thoughts? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, Thank you very much for those very kind words and your support. I'm very honored and grateful to continue in this mission with the GEU. Uh, I look forward to continue uh, to work with everybody here. I know I have very big shoes to fill uh, with the loss of Detective Captain Connors, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the challenge and I'm looking forward to the work ahead. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. And just to add, Captain, um, uh, Banks, uh, Detective um, K 
Captain Connors was a great mentor for you and the entire GEU unit. I'm eager to see how you make this position your own. And as you heard, um, everyone is very excited that this has happened fortuitously, um, that the two, the two promotions occurred at the same time and we get to have you stay right with us. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Much. Great. Thank you. Now, um, and Vivian, I did allow you to record as well. Great. Thank you. And I think um, we've, we've got to get started. We have a busy morning and, a, and a, another um, public meeting this afternoon for um, the Gaming Policy Advising Committee. I know members of the team here are going to be in both meetings, so we'll stay on task. We'll get going with the administrative unit today. Um, Executive Director Wells is out enjoying some deserved vacation time, and we have Director Lilios. There you good are. Morning, Chair. Hi, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, quickly and publicly congratulate both Brian and, and Mike and state how much I'm looking forward to uh, working uh, with the team under, under Mike's leadership. Um, with respect to our update this morning, I have uh, a brief update uh, for you with two pieces of information. Uh, the first pertains to MGM Springfield. Up until now, their hotel has been uh, open but limited to invited and hosted guests. As of this Friday, the 18th, the hotel will be open to uh, all guests and guests will be able to make reservations online and over the telephone. Uh, so that is a, a big turn uh, for MGM and I wanted to note that. Uh, and the other update has to do with operations at Encore. Uh, this past weekend, the uh, nightclub uh, memoir uh, did uh, open. They uh, resolved some staff, were able to resolve some staffing issues and open this past weekend. And I, I did learn from uh, GEU uh, over the weekend that uh, things went uh, smoothly. Uh, so there'll be ongoing uh, communications there um, between GEU and, you know, uh, uh, and the operator, uh, and I have every reason to um, think that that will continue to go well. I note that um, Assistant Director Band is in our meeting this morning, and uh, he's got his finger on the pulse of operations over the weekend uh, and may be able to update you on some additional items. Yeah. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, my update is limited as well. Uh, the Three properties continue to bring all their slots online, remove uh, the plastic dividers. Uh, it's a slow but, but steady rate going forward, uh, but there's nothing to, significant to report. Everything is moving ahead positively and uh, steady. Any questions? Commissioner O'Brien? All set. And I think, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, we'd want to have these continued reports, um, particularly as we have a uh, couple of conditions outstanding. Okay. Excellent. I see her nodding her head. Thanks. No questions, uh, Commissioner Zunagar, Commissioner Cameron? All right. Thank you, um, Director Lilios, and thank you, Bruce. Um, and I think, uh, do you have anything else, Loretta, that may have popped up? I, I do not. I suggest you move on to, uh, to item three, legislative affairs. Okay, great. Um, good morning, uh, Director Griffin. Good morning, Chair Judd Stein, and good morning, Commissioners. Um, uh, commissioners, um, I think you've all had an opportunity to review MGC staff written um, draft white papers on sports wagering. Um, I'll just review a little bit um, the two papers. As an expert in responsible gaming, Director Vander Linden has made recommendations related to sports wagering in responsible gaming. By contrast, talented program manager Crystal Howard has compiled a fact-based update on the status of play in the US that you may remember as an update to the publication written by Justin Stembeck and Paul Connolly in 2018. Um, this paper takes no policy recommendations. 
Um, the status of play, as you can imagine, is fast paced and might have already changed as I'm speaking to you today. Um, Director Vander Linden and Program Manager Howard will not be presenting the papers today, but we are seeking a go ahead to finalize so that we can distribute to stakeholders, including legislators, members of um, Gaming Policy Advisory Committee, um, and we anticipate also um, posting the papers publicly. If I could add to, um... I, the plan would be for the, the papers to be presented to us in a, um, for the MGC in a training um, that's anticipated that Karen will be organizing uh, in, the, in the near future, probably in the month of July, um, in substitution of any of a, maybe a planned um, hiatus from our, our organized public meetings. Do you have um, any, I think that you're looking for the go-ahead, were there um, edits or thoughts that you wanted to convey to uh, Director Griffin commissioners? Um, I think that there was a, uh, you received uh, final sort of edits, uh, redlined version with the draft last night. Um, with that said, these papers are, 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 are dense and if you and also uh, quite thoughtful if you have any additions you'd like to convey I have, I have a couple on the sports uh, paper and and one minor suggested edit on the on the uh, responsible gaming mm -hmm. um, I um, and I, by the way, let me start by saying that these are great compilations of a lot of research. Um, uh, clearly, uh, Crystal, Jill, uh, others spent a lot of time. And I'm now talking about the, the sports um, betting uh, white paper. Uh, spent a lot of time um, uh, researching what has happened and, and, and trying to summarize what I think is, is a very variable history because states clearly have been doing different things in, in different ways for a variety of reasons. Um, but there are, there are two things that I think um, we ought to consider explaining or at a, a minimum um, be prepared to explain you know, when potentially the question comes back, if it does. Um, the first one is the concept of skins. When we, in the paper, when we try to, when we begin, um, I think, uh, I forget the page, but we start with the notion of skins. And I think it's important to perhaps lay out why it may be necessary to, what, why, why it is that certain states do a limit on skins and, and why is that important for the competition in, in the industry and why uh, in on consumer choice. Um, there are, as I understand, usually when there are more than one skin, with some limits, um, operators are able to trade access to those different markets um, by having one skin in one state and being able to access um, another state to, um, to the skin of someone else. And therefore, they join an agreement. And um, different states have also done things differently in terms of those numbers of skins. Um, but, and I, we, I know we not take a, a position in terms of policy. It's something that the legislature ought to understand, in my opinion, because different operators here in Massachusetts are gonna have different say into whether or not to have multiple skins um, per, per, uh, per operator. Um, depending on where you, how many states you are, you may not be interested in having uh, many skins, but if you are not, as an operator who wants hand trade to the sports bearing world, you might be interested in more skins that you can then trade access to. Um, again, this, the, I don't know if this fits in the paper or not at this point, but it's something that we should be prepared to answer or at a minimum to, cons to, to put in some way um, why that's uh, something that they should consider from a policy standpoint. Um, and the other one is um, 
we we I think we do a they do a great job. You you um putting all the sports betting revenue in other states, especially compared to you know I like particularly the charts that that put in the percentage, um and how that percentage that can vary quite a bit in the last year because of the pandemic, etc. But uh, and there's also another number that gets in there, which is three five million in Massachusetts revenue that. At some point recently, um, that I think the, the administration considered uh, as a potential first year revenue for Massachusetts. Um, I think it's important to try to put some of that into context. I don't know if we have knowledge of that, but I know, I, I, I recall that that number may have assumed a low tax rate. Uh, when we talk about the, what that $35 million may mean to Massachusetts, uh, we then go into a section that explains high and low tax rates and appropriately discusses why, what, what are the pros and cons of one. But, but if we know what, what a tax rate was assumed for that figure, um, that might be a better context for the reader, uh, especially if they're looking at it from a Massachusetts perspective compared to other states. How do we stack up in that? 35 million for the first year or for a future year, whatever that may be. Uh, again, it's trying to put into context that. that um, but other than that, I think it, it does, as, as the prior one, uh, I think it strikes a really good balance in trying to um, articulate what is a very variable. Um, there's some significant differences across the states. That's the main message that anybody should take away from that. There's really clear implications um, into you know whatever they decide to do if they do decide to do anything, uh, and and great examples of um, the contexts of other states. What happens with a high rate? There may not be a total elimination of the black or gray market, for example, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I I I think. Um, those are two things that I thought might be worth considering, but otherwise I like very much uh, the way, um, the length and the way that it lays out, um, you know, what is clearly a lot of nascent developments in very recent years. If I could make a suggestion, those are two great comments, uh, Commissioner, maybe with respect to um, the, uh, the revenue number of the th 35, is it 35 or 30, yeah, 35 million, um, Perhaps, Crystal, on page eight, where you note that the policy conversations regarding tax rates focus on striking the proper balance, perhaps you could add a footnote to say something about the revenues that were estimated by um, the governor in his budget this year um, was, was the 35 million repeat it, and then say, uh, in turn, you, we could offer what the tax rate is on um, in that proposal. Would that would that help give that 35 million some context, um, Commissioner Zuniga? Uh, yeah, yeah, even if it's a footnote, I remember, I, I, I'm sorry I should have gone to the prior uh, um, white paper, but I remember there were three scenarios in the last one, between 10, 15, 20%, we, we didn't, you know, we didn't go into high tax rates in the white paper. And right. they assumed different things in terms of revenue because it's not a one for one. It's not like a higher tax rate is gonna bring necessarily more revenue because again, there's there's a participation of the market that you know is not directly correlated. Um, right. And that paper still stands. So that yeah, analysis yeah. is well, you know, uh, available and actually read and it, it it was in someone's hand that prompted us to say we really need to do uh, right. an update. Uh, so I think that the two combined, maybe with that notation, it gives that 35 million some context some that context. will address it. Uh, and then with respect to the skins, I think that might take a little bit more thought, Crystal um, and Jill, but perhaps at least generally um, reflect that uh, the number of, of skins, um, even if this is um, that, get, that get actually operationalized, may be influenced greatly by the market forces themselves. Is that fair, Commissioner Sumika? That is, that is very much fair, yes. And it's around, um, you know, operators, uh, you know, being able to compete, which is something we, you know, they, the legislature and us may want to entertain. 
with some limit without just a, you know, an open wide um, you know, environment. Um, and that also gives consumer choice, um, not just you know, uh, one or two platforms, again, yeah. for market reasons. Excellent. Did you have any thoughts on um, Director Vanderlinden's paper that you wanted to add? I yeah. know you had had a chance to review that in advance. I did, and I, I did work, uh, you know, I did see that in, in, in a lot more detail uh, before. Um, there is, this is a lot more surgical, and either at the beginning, in the introduction, or at the end, uh, I would insert uh, the, the sentence, something to the effect of um, dedicated dollars from gaming taxes for research programs, uh, research and, and, and mitigation programs. Uh, the, the, the good about the Gaming Act that we all know um, was, was um, very important and as it's articulated um, uh, in the paper, was that it provided uh, dedicated money for research and responsible gaming programs. And I would invite the, the notion of, you know, preserving that uh, policy um, explicitly because I think it's a little lost uh, um, currently. I could tell you exactly if you're interested in, in, in what in the, in the This is from introduction. Director Vanderlinden's yes. introduction. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do, you want it, do you want it now, uh, Mark? Would that be helpful or would you prefer after? Um, Now's good? Sure, yeah. I mean, I'll we, we want to okay. keep this moving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hold on, because that came, I, um, I didn't have it open necessarily. It, it can come afterwards too, but um, the sooner you can pass it along. It if if somebody out. has other comments and wants to go okay. on, I can find it in the meantime. Okay, that makes good sense. Commissioner O'Brien or Commissioner Cameron? What, Commissioner um, O'Brien, Commissioner Cameron will have her go next. That would be good because we had the chance to look at the one of the papers. Thanks, Eileen. No, I did. I looked at them um, quickly having gotten them. Um, I, I thought they were both really good and on point. Um, you know, I might have some more stylistic comments if, if we weren't sort of under time pressure, but I think given the, probably the timeliness of getting these out, I think these, these look good. So I don't really have any substantive changes or comments to make at this time. Great, thank you. And, and yes, um, and, and stylistically, of course, we can all adopt our own. I have to say that um, I like the contrast of the two styles and they reflect um, the, the nature of the work. I thought that, um, just, it was, um, you know, Crystal, you taking this on in shot, such short notice and being able to capture what really is the essence here. It's just changing and every jurisdiction um, really has learned from the other ones before it. So you captured that and then um, uh, Mark and Marie Claire, uh, your voices are, are very clear in, in, the, in the paper. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I, um, like Commissioner Zuniga, I had the benefit of watching the iterations um, with with the sports wagering, and um, and frankly, it was excellent from the beginning. Um, you know, a couple of tweaks so that we all can understand things clearly, but I, I just think it's uh, it's so well done and really, really timely. Um, and you know, I, I try to remember this is staff's work. And secondly, um, there was a real effort to stay away from policy. And I think for good reason, right? So um, some of the, um, some of the uh, edits maybe with regard to um, Commissioner Zuniga's points, um, I think if we can do that without, because it, it does border on policy, right? So trying to, um, trying to just reflect, maybe give some more information about what you know, a skin and how it can be, how it's effective and what it can offer. I think that's really good because that's informative without getting into, you know, why states, because we really don't know why other states did what they did, right? We know what they did, but we don't necessarily know why. Um, so I think the timing of this is really, really good. It's an excellent work. It will be utilized with this discussion coming up this week. And um, with regard to the responsible gaming, um, Excellent work, uh, Mark. I love the uh, strategies. Quickly, in detail, one, two, three, four. Boom. Those, those are so easy to read. The graphics are excellent, and here it is, right here. These are the best practices. So I think that's really well done uh, as well. And I just had a chance to read it 
recently, so I didn't know the the uh, the different iterations. But really, really, uh, you know, just reading it, it made so much sense. I found myself shaking my head, like, yes, this is easy to follow and absolutely a best practice. So, so I just want to thank the team for the work because it really was the, the you know you proud of a commission that puts together work like this, frankly. So, so um, thank you and well done. Chair Hi. Jed Stein, do you yes. mind if I say one more comment? Uh -oh, absolutely, and I might add one more comment too, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> Go right ahead, Commissioner, Director Griffin. So um, in addition to um, personally acknowledging Crystal Howard's great work, um, I'd, um, I'd like to acknowledge that Marie Claire also participated in the Responsible Gaming Project. Um, I think one of her first projects here, um, and she worked with Director Vander Linden, and um, so I just I didn't want to miss that opportunity as well. Thank you, thank you, um, uh, Jill. I I did squeeze in Marie Claire earlier, um, and 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 we are thrilled that she came on right at that time. I know Mark, you really appreciated um, her expertise. It's exactly what you were looking for. And, uh, and, and really an exciting opportunity for, for you and for her. Um, you know, I just want to acknowledge that uh, this was a very strong teamwork that was turned around quickly with deadlines in mind. Sometimes we just have to operate on tough deadlines. And I, I know that this team always has that capacity. And while it's demanding, it is with great gratitude that we um, acknowledge your, your dedication over these last several weeks to get this work done. So, so thank you for rising to that challenge and, and surpassing it. Um, we at uh, the Gaming Commission are happy to um, um, respond to outside um, inquiries, including the legislatures. The team has been able to do that. We, of course, don't assume anything about the sports betting legislation. Right now, the proposals that are out there do um, name the gaming commission as the potential regulator but we'll stay we stay tuned and and we do that without presumption um, and with humility and with an acknowledgement that in the event we are named the regulator we will be prepared and we will be timely um, and, um, and and assume the responsibilities just like so many of you did back um, when expanded gaming came into fruition so Thank you, and I think I hear, commissioners, we have a consensus that Jill has the green light. Okay, with a few Thanks. edits, and we'll keep them high level. Commissioner Zuniga, in the event we really need to revisit, it's okay to do an amendment um, to a, a future version if, it, if we don't quite capture exactly what you intended. Okay, okay. Uh, th thank you. Do, do did you want, can I, could I do the- Oh yeah, you can go back edit? to Mark now. Sure, sure, thank okay. you. So um, on page, uh, I'm sorry, it's the first one. It's really on the introduction mm -hmm. um, where it says, um, you know, the legislature created a vision. They understood that to achieve this, there must also be a plan to mitigate gambling related harm. I would strike the rest of that sentence and insert something like, and dedicated significant dollars from gaming taxes for research and responsible gaming programs. In other words, keep credit to the legislature for what they did in the Gaming Act. Um, and by implication, um, a good bit of a blueprint on what to do anymore if, if there was any more gaming expansion. Great. Right. Um, we're happy to, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Commissioner, um, we can turn that around right away um, and we'll send it back and, and see if it captures what you're thinking. Okay. Excellent. Green light, commissioners, yes. yes. Excellent, thank you so much. I, I suspect, um, Jill, you'll, um, you and Crystal and, and Mark, uh, I don't think you have other items. If you need to be excused, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank moving you. on then. Moving on to um, item, item um, number four, an, an exciting update for, for you, um, 
a, a different update. We haven't had a discussion around boundaries of the gaming establishment for a while, Todd. So good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, and uh, everyone. Um, Item number four, as, as the chair mentioned, does pertain to a petition to amend the boundary of the gaming establishment at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, and there up pops uh, North uh, Groundsville, the uh, general manager of the property who will uh, present the bulk of the request. Um, in advance um, of his presentation though, uh, which will outline the details of the actual plan, I thought it might be helpful just to quickly discuss some of the legal principles that govern the decision to help tee up uh, the ultimate review. Um, and I, I believe the um, proposal is in the commissioner's packet, so you can see what he will be presenting uh, shortly. The specific request as depicted in the presentation is essentially that the previous uh, approved racing apron area be expanded further beyond the existing boundary line to allow for a fire pit area adjacent uh, to the surface parking lot next to the racetrack. The commission initially set the boundary for the gaming establishment at PPC um, on June 11, 2015. And in establishing uh, that boundary, the commission considered a number of provisions contained in Chapter 23K. First and foremost, though, is the definition of the term gaming establishment itself, which is in Chapter 23K, Section 2. And the statute defines the term gaming establishment as the premises approved under a gaming license, which includes a gaming area and any other non-gaming structure related to the game, and may include but shall not be limited to hotels, restaurants, and or other amenities. So that's the definition of the term gaming establishment in the statute. So from the definition, it is clear that the gaming area itself must be included in the gaming establishment, and that sounds uh, pretty obvious. Beyond that, though, the use of the term may in the definition also makes clear that the law was designed to give the commission great latitude to include any other element of the property it deemed necessary uh, to ensure proper regulation and control over the property and the, uh, the activities of the licensee. The law does, of course, provide guidance as to which other elements and amenities should and may be considered uh, for inclusion in the gaming establishment. And what I mean by that is that by definition, any element that is included must be a non-gaming structure that is related to the gaming area. The definition includes some examples as to the types of elements that were envisioned to be included under that part of the definition. And it specifically references hotels, restaurants, and other amenities. Uh, so that's, that's where the statute uh, leaves us. So in determining the boundaries of the three gaming establishments previously, the commission came up with what is essentially a four-part test which aids in the analysis and, and governs the review of these types uh, of issues. Um, and it helps us determine whether to include or exclude a particular element um, of the subject property within the boundary of the gaming establishment. And the four elements that were discussed previously, and this is um, by way of written decision that the commission issued a number of years ago, the four elements are whether uh, the area is a non-gaming structure, whether it is related to the gaming area, whether it is under common ownership and control of the gaming licensee, and fourth, whether the commission has a regulatory interest in including it as part of the gaming establishment. This fourth part, the regulatory interest, only comes into play if the first three elements are satisfied. And in each of the previous three cases in which the commission determined the boundary of a gaming establishment, there was actually another associated factor that was looked at. And that is whether the area at issue is essentially curtilage or is a pertinent to an area of the gaming establishment that otherwise meets that part test. 
And that, for example, is how the racing apron area at PPC was included initially in the boundary in the first place. There are um, actually examples of this, the curtilage and appurtenance uh, uh, considerations that are in play in the other two gaming establishments as well. So as well, it's not limited to just uh, planar Park. So in the present matter, the analysis I suggest would focus first on the racing part of the building where the wagers are placed. So there is an actual building uh, that we're looking at. Uh, that part of the building, as we all know, was included in the boundary of the gaming establishment as it met the four part test that I just uh, discussed. The racing apron was considered to be the curtilage to that part of the gaming establishment and thus related um, to the, the racing building, and so it was included as well. So the next part of the analysis uh, here then is whether the new area, which extends further down the racing uh, apron, um, is still part of that curtilage, or it is a pertinent to the gaming establishment as it presently exists. Curtilage and appurtenance are essentially legal terms of art that are intended to cover the area outside of a building that the law recognizes to be closely enough related to the building that a privacy or other type interest should be afforded to it. For example, this typically comes up in the context of the area surrounding a residential dwelling, like the lawn or a walkway or something like that, where a homeowner still has some privacy interest, though not as great as the interest inside the home. So a curtilage or a pertinence is something right outside of a building that is closely related uh, to the building and, and used as part of the building. So that's that's just the broad overview of uh, what uh, Mr. Groundsell is about to discuss. Um, happy to revisit some of these issues after his presentation. Uh, but unless there are any questions, um, I'd like to just uh, turn the, the matter over to North at the moment to run through his petition. Thank you, Councillor Grossman, and uh, thank you, Commissioners, Madam Chair, um, for the opportunity to present to you this morning. So I will take just a little bit of time to go over both the written document that we provided to you, which was our petition, skipping over the portions that relate to authority and law, because I am not an attorney, and Councillor Grossman is going to do a much better job of summing up that portion of the analysis. Um, in terms of setting context of what it is that we're asking for, I think it's appropriate to kind of maybe think back in time um, as restaurants began to open in the US uh, in June of 2020. And when that happened, very quickly, two problems became evident. Um, for folks who operated restaurants, restaurant tours, the capacity limits placed on indoor seating made it very difficult to provide jobs and make a profit. And for public health officials, allowing more people to congregate in a confined setting without masks represented a public health risk that outweighed any economic benefit the additional capacity to bring. So it was in this context that municipalities, public health officials, and restaurateurs began offering alfresco or outside dining. Across the United States, restaurants spilled out onto sidewalks, some towns closed streets, and restaurant patrons spent much of the summer of 2020 eating outside. The summer drew to a close, it became apparent that some customers wanted to continue outdoor dining well into the fall and winter months. Outdoor heated patios and transparent domes or igloos popped up everywhere, and many restaurants found these options in such high demand that reservations for the spaces were required. So as Plain Ridge Park entered the late winter months of 2021, it became clear that alfresco dining was something that our guests would want this summer. And it was in this context that we sought to create an outdoor space that provided the opportunity for food, beverage, and live music. In order to provide the outdoor entertainment area for our guests, PPC is requesting an amendment to the premises of the gaming establishment. And that, that requested amendment area is shown in your packet um, on page one of the exhibit packet. Uh, I'll flip to that in a minute. So talking a little bit about our discussion of this, you know, as, as Councillor Grossman pointed out, there's a four part test uh, that applies to whether or not a piece of property is part, can be considered part of the gaming establishment. 
So the proposed amendment that we're talking about to the racing apron clearly meets the four criteria set out above in that uh, it is a non-gaming structure. There will be permanent fire pits located in the area in question. And we, we are asserting that it is part of the property curtilage, mainly by virtue of the fact that the fencing that will enclose the space extends the enclosure of the current area. Um, and that, that area was previously deemed as curtilage. The proposed space is related to the gaming area in that it su uh, supports the gaming area by making the entire facility a more attractive destination. Area is under common control of PPC, and by virtue of the first three criteria being met, we arrive at the last point about whether or not the commission has a regulatory interest in including the area in this space, in this space as part of the gaming establishment. Now, obviously, that is a determination for the commission to make. Um, we at PPC are here asking for uh, this amendment to be made, uh, believing that it, it does represent a good regulatory interest. In further support of our amendment, um, we would note that the request here is very limited in scope. We're talking about 250 square feet, 2,500 roughly square feet um, in space. The, we have met with the town of Plainville. They're aware of all of our plans and all necessary permits, inspections, and licenses will be complete prior to opening. So with that, um, I will take just a moment and share with you the uh, presentation that we have that gives just some visuals to what we're talking about here, which should be included in your packet. Um, and as we, as I set this up, I just want to make sure that everyone is able to see my screen. We can. If you, if you want, you can even expand it if you're able to. There you go. Okay, perfect. Perfect, Great. yeah. So uh, I'll kind of we're going to kind of zoom in here. Um, if you look at this original drawing, is the the original boundaries of the premises of the gaming establishment. So that is the dark line that outlines all of the different areas of the casino. You can see that it extends here underneath the ballet port of share, extends behind the back, encompasses a portion of the racing apron, comes back around and goes around the outer edge of the building. And as Councillor Grossman said, this was established on the June 11th, 2015 meeting. If we look about the specific area in, in discussion here, um, we are looking at a, a space that is roughly 50 feet by 50 feet. Um, and so you can see the racing air apron here. This is a small structure where we allowed walk up wagering throughout um, the Kentucky Derby last year, uh, this, this year and in 2020 as well. And there's a small covered area right here. Um, should this be uh, approved, the area in question specifically is the one that's currently shown uh, with grass here. So currently we do have an alcohol permit for this area. We do occasionally serve food and liquor. Uh, and alcoholic beverages in this area, and we do have some existing seating that exists within this area. Uh, in the next section, this is kind of, again, zooming down one more level of detail just to show a plan for what the area would look like from above. Um, so we've got two fire pits here in the center, flanked by several picnic tables, and then an area in the back where there would be space for a food truck uh, to come in and out of the space. So this is a mixed use area. Um, there would be, uh, in the area in question, the particular area that we're asking for the amendment uh, would primarily just be the service of food, outdoor dining, um, and for just for a place for patrons to sit and relax while they listen to some music or play some games, things like that. Um, this is a, a, a very simple rendering of kind of what we're looking at for the space. So it's a very short extension to the uh, existing racing apron. Um, we are talking about a, a section that is very limited in, in its scope of, of what the ask is here. Um, and with that, uh, we've also got some kind of marketing materials of what it is that we would show to customers. We're considering calling this area the patio. Um, and just a little bit more about what the space would be considered uh, from a guest perspective. So uh, with that, I will conclude my, my presentation and, and stop for 
questions that the commission may have. Well. Commissioners, questions for North? Um, why don't I go one at a time? Commissioner Bryan, if you're ready. No, the only question, so the, the very first time I went down there and saw that space, I was curious as to why it actually hadn't been utilized that way already. Um, so I'm actually not surprised to have you guys coming in now and asking for it. Uh, if anything, I thought maybe you'd go a little further out. I know at a certain point you need the buffer, but there's the access to the track at that point, maybe that plays into it. But um, do you foresee this getting, coming back and getting bigger, or you feel like this is the space that you need to optimize? I think that's an excellent question, Commissioner. Um, at, at this point, we, we, the, the simple answer is I don't know. Um, I understand that there are limits here in terms of how far we can push this space um, from the commission standpoint. Uh, you know, I don't want to um, push our luck as it, as it would be, but all things being equal, I would love for it to be so popular that we need to extend even further. Um, there are definitely partnerships that we are exploring right now and we expect to have 67 Degrees, who is a local brewer um, in Franklin and is also a minority and veteran company, uh, begin a tap tech takeover with us um, here. Ideally, um, they will be inside the casino for the celebration of Juneteenth so that we can provide support to a minority owned business uh, during that time. Uh, but will definitely be with us in the outdoor area that is not part of the portion being considered today. Um, here towards the end of the month. So we see that there are a lot of opportunities here, you know, as, as we look at serving a number of guests and people who want to eat outside, we think this can be a competitive offer. Thank you. Yep. Commissioner uh, Cam, oh, Commissioner Zunica, sorry, Commissioner Cameron. He's, uh, he leaned in. Uh, uh, thank you. No, I, well, only because I actually remember um, that space being used for some programming I believe when the where the casino was when the casino was under construction, but there was actually racing going on. Um, there was some um, I, I remember a pony and some other kind of you know um, snacks and things like that, which I think is very appropriate. Um, so I think I, I, I like the rendering and the use. I'm, I'm glad you're um, you're thinking um, you know creatively to try to expand offerings. I don't see any adjacencies issues, of course, here. It's all within your property. There's no other um, property owner or public space or anything like that that could, you know, um, not fit within the definitions that you um, that you uh, uh, articulate, you know, in terms of curtilage and whatnot. So I, I'm, I'm very much on board and uh, with, with, um, uh, with the request. Commissioner Cameron. Thank you. Uh, I agree with all of that. I am on board with this too. I think it's a great use of space. People do enjoy um, outdoor space um, in particular, even more now than before, right? Um, the only question I had was, I, I suspect all of the, the entrance will come through the apron, right? So to, to enter this piece, you need to come in through the racing area and out through the apron. Is that correct? Yes, Commissioner Cameron, that is correct. It, there was a, you did have a, um, a gate at the chain link fence, but that would not be for entrance, that would be for other purposes? Um, so Commissioner Cameron, there are actually on the, the rendering, there are two gates in there. One is a crash bar as an exit or an egress for the space that's necessary to remain, um, for egress. The other one, which you may be referring to as you look at the rendering of this space would be in the northwest corner of the map, which would be a double gate, um, that which would remain locked when operational, but is there primarily to allow um, a rotation of food trucks to come in and out of the space. Um, so that's primarily the reason for the other gate. I will also add for whatever it's worth, because I think I might see where you're, you're going here, Commissioner. We do have good surveillance on the space. Um, we have three unobstructed views of the space from a variety of different angles, and we are um, adding another angle that a little bit more close to the Great, excellent. That's exactly where I was going. I assumed that that was for um, use by, you know, to bring in equipment, tables, the, the food truck, whatnot, but I just wanted to clarify, but uh, I, I agree with uh, 
everyone's comments so far, and I do think there is a regulatory interest in us approving this. So thank you. Thank you so much. Just a couple of uh, uh, clarifiers. Uh, Director Lilios, your team has had a chance to review um, the plan and including Bruce Spann and the gaming agents in terms of the surveillance and, and there you are, Bruce. Lorena, do you want to comment? So we, we have been involved. I've been um, uh, coordinated with Todd and we've jointly met with uh, North and uh, with Lisa McKenney at, at PPC. Uh, you know, I uh, think Todd's legal analysis is, you know, very helpful. Uh, I think the request is a modest request and understandable uh, request, you know, even pandemic aside, uh, everybody um, wants to eke every hour out of uh, the ability to be outdoors. Uh, North did mention the uh, camera coverage issue that's already been discussed with uh, Bruce Band's team, uh, and we're you know, completely confident that that will be uh, fully addressed. It's in the process of being addressed uh, now. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I think the request is, is understandable and uh, from the IEB's perspective, uh, fully expect that it's a, it's a, workable, uh, a workable adjustment. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Bruce, you were chiming in. I saw you nodding your head that you're all satisfied from a surveillance point of view to um, assure compliance issues. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the second is, do you anticipate, North, that this will be um, all year round? You mentioned igloos, or do you see this as, as seasonal um, associated mainly with horse racing? Um, so that's an excellent question, Madam Chair. I, I think that as we, we look at the, the summer, um, I, some of that will depend on how strong the demand is for the area. Mm -hmm. I think the fire pits give us some options there in terms of extending into the shoulder seasons. I think as we get into the, the deep winter months, I would be very surprised if we're looking in February-ish, uh, January, February of seeing patrons out there. But I think that the, you know, the heating portion provided by the fire pits, we plan on selling s'mores so that people, people can make their own s'mores out there, that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll lend to an atmosphere where people may want to extend into those shoulder seasons. Um, but I, I would think that we're probably operational somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to eight months a year. If I had put my best guess on there, but we shall see. Exciting. Um, Loretta, I know that we will be uh, discussing PPC's alcohol beverages certificate because they have separate and apart from this issue, um, a renewal um, uh, requirement coming up. And, and I wanted to just clarify the question I asked you earlier today. Um, if we go ahead and approve this request, this is a request for expansion of the apron, and the apron already has an alcohol beverages certificate, so it would it, that certificate would cover this expansion um, without thinking about the need for the renewal right now. So for June 8, if we didn't act on the renewal today by chance, um, we would have a gap, um, or would we not? On the certificate. I, I think you would have a, a, a gap um, uh, chair. Uh, the, the license packet uh, today uh, would, uh, we, um, you know, Nikesh is prepared to have the conversation with Good. you uh, today yeah. uh, in the event that you allow the expansion. She will update the blueprint in her packet with the new blueprint uh, showing the new boundary. Right, so I'll let Nikisha address that. I just wanted to make sure I was, you know, we're using the language, the apron is an expansion of the apron. It's not a new term. Um, okay, good. Uh, so those were my questions. I guess my comment is um, threefold. One, I think it's an exciting opportunity for horse racing um, as an enhancement uh, to that offering. Um, of course, it's also an exciting opportunity for your casino guests. Anytime a casino brings their patrons outdoors, you're providing an opportunity for a necessary break, an opportunity for some good fresh air and vitamin D, 
and it's an alternative route that hasn't been followed in the past by casinos. So um, I like that a whole lot. And I also see it as a, a real um, opportunity for demographic expansion, and I know you're thinking that. Um, so I like this proposal a whole lot. Um, it is modest. It looks like you're almost just doubling that space, right, North? It's almost like replicating it. And, and I, too, had the same question as Commissioner O'Brien, that you know, but I do hear you. You want to um, uh, see how the commission feels about this and then also see how it goes. So we'll stay tuned. And, um, but I do think you, um, Todd, need a vote on this issue before us under, under item number four. Unless there are any other questions or, uh, for North or Todd. All right. Commissioner O'Brien, are you able to help out on that? Certainly, Madam Chair. Uh, I move that the commission amend the boundaries of the gaming establishment of Plain Ridge Park Casino to include the area appurtenant to the existing racing apron for the reasons discussed today and as described and outlined in the commissioner's packet. Second. Great. Um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And I vote yes. Exciting. Uh, congratulations on that, North. Um, all goes well, I, uh, you'll be able to have some festivities on Friday, correct? Fantastic, thank you. Okay, good, good. I, I, want, I want to know if, if North is going back to his poker game. <laughs> Hold on, guys, just one second, guys. we played this last game. <laughs> <laughs> that really brought home um, a, a family memory for me, North. My, my dad had similar similar backgrounds or pictures in our, our, our camp in Vermont, so it's fun. Um, great, so we'll get started then on our next item, which is um, of equal importance for, you, for PPC. Good morning, Chief Skinner. Oh, oh there you go. Oh, there, yeah, good morning. Uh, good morning. Chair. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, everyone. Um, Commissioners, for your review and consideration today is a request for approval of uh, PPT's gaming beverage license renewal. PPT's current license expires on June 24, 2021. They submitted timely application to renew on May 7, 45 days before the current license expiration, as required by Commission regulations. And their application was deemed administratively complete on June 10. All of the information required to be contained in the application is included, and you have it uh, available to you in the packet. So things like floor plans, a description of how the alcoholic beverages will be stored and secured, hours of service uh, and capacity are all addressed uh, and satisfactory. Uh, the renewal packet consists of um, first, PPC's umbrella license uh, plus the 10 licensed areas. Uh, so we have an application for each of those uh, areas. Uh, there are the gaming floor, uh, of course, uh, the banquet room, food court, uh, lights and smash burger restaurants, Flutie Sports Bar, Slack Oyster House and Grill, uh, the lounges, we've got Revolution 1776 and High Limit. Um, and of course, the racing area venues. Uh, there's Mountain Skipper Express, Dark Horse Bar, and the Racing Apron, uh, which is now expanded per your earlier vote. Um, and as touched on earlier today, uh, we will need to supplement the application with the updated map. Um, and I think I heard that the, the request from PPC is to utilize that space beginning this Friday, um, which you know I wasn't aware of, um, unfortunately. So I think that um, unless there's an amendment to the existing gaming beverage license, um, then we will have a gap. Because the material presented to you today 
discusses the renewal effect of January, excuse me, January, June 24. So the existing uh, uh, approval that PPC is operating under um, does not extend to, in terms of the racing apron, it does not extend currently to that uh, expanded area. And that's my understanding. I, I apologize, Nikisha. Um, I should have clarified. We have extended our beginning opening date to the 25th. So um, if that makes life a little bit easier, we've run into some supply chain issues with deliveries as, as everyone is seeing the pandemic. So we're looking actually at the 25th at our first day of operation. So I misspoke. It's not the 18th. Okay, the 25th. So does that help you, Nikisha? It does. Thank you. Thank you, North. <laughs> um, so that would presume, though, that do we can we act on it now, Loretta, or do we have to do we have to have another commission meeting in advance of the of that? We may you know, well. I'd recommend that you act on it uh, now, um, and it can be effective. Uh, upon the expiration of the uh, the first the fir uh, the existing license so I would recommend that you act on on the renewal now and I agree with that okay Nikisha sorry I was uh, directing to uh, to Loretta only because I asked a question early this morning and I'm trying to catch up so thank you Nikisha um, so does that mean and, and again um, forgive me do we need How do we vote on this? I know that we have motions. Do we need an additional motion now? Or God, I, I don't have the motions in front, the, rec, the, the draft motions that we use for guidance only. If, I may, uh, yeah. if, I, if I may offer, um, yeah. I, I don't think we need a, an additional vote on this particular piece of it, um, given that as North stated, the area won't be, be uh, uh, begin to be utilized until the 25th. And what, you're, what you'll be voting on today is the renewal that is effective on uh, the 25th. So I think it is appropriate to, to, to move forward based on uh, the vote that's before you today. And the fact that this that the new space is really an extension of what's already described as the racing apron. Well, the only condition might be, you know, subject to clarification of the revised drawing on Correct. the apron. Right. That would really be the only thing that would be noted in the motion and that we would vote on. That makes sense. Agreed. And, and uh, Nikisha and I were already discussed this morning, and I think she already mentioned that she will supplement the packet with the new map of the apron. Correct. And all and, of the, like, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, and, and I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I'm really clear on process. And that presumes another meeting in advance of next Friday? No. 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 We, okay, good. That's what I so, so when you say supplement the packet. So, so your vote, um, the, the motion before you, as uh, Eileen mentioned, if you could add language uh, to indicate uh, as reflected in the addition of the uh, new map of the racing apron. Right, I think if we mention item 4A and say the, the area the new area, you know, noted in today's packet in 4A, then I think it covers the area we need to cover. I think so. I think that's great. Yeah. No. Um, we, we don't want to slow down those some more. Uh, all of the licensed areas are operated by PPC, meaning there are no jointly responsible persons at play here. Um, in a particular note, there's no bottle service at any of the licensed areas. If approved, this will be PPC's second uh, renewal. And for this renewal, PPC has a new food and beverage director, Damian Hink, who will be in charge of all of the licensed areas. 
Um, Damien transferred to PPC from another Penn National property in March of this year. And during the licensing application review process, he readily made himself available for the necessary dialogue and documentation. Uh, I understand he has 15 years in the food and beverage industry, which is a great start, uh, but he also certified that he has read and understands the commission's regulations regarding the gaming beverage license. Uh, so we'll hold him to that. <laughs> um, and I'm recommending the commission approve PPC's gaming beverage renewal application. But before I take your questions, if you have any, um, and before you take a vote, I'd like you to hear IEB's findings. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Loretta and Bruce. Thanks, Nikisha. So I, I concur with uh, Nikisha's recommendation and the recommendation was reached after a review of uh, PPC's compliance history around the alcohol uh, beverage licenses and after consultation with our partners at the uh, ABCC. Uh, so uh, for I uh, thought it would be helpful to for you to have a little more detail on that and I'd like to turn it over uh, to Bert Kane and Andrew Steffen uh, who can give you a, a short recap of the compliance history. Thank you, Rebecca, Nikisha, um, good morning, Madam Chair, just a kind of brief prepared comment, touching on a few aspects of the IEP inspection of the liquor outlets at PPC, uh, after which we'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, first, with regards to the storage and security of the alcohol outlets, the IEP conducts inspections of all kind of outlets on a nightly basis. This is completed through our surveillance monitoring system or through an actual physical, physical inspection on the casino floor and back of house. Uh, the IEB ensures all outlets are secured by checking beer tap locks, cooler door locks, and alcohol storage doors. Uh, with regards to the surveillance aspects, the IEB conducts weekly alcohol reviews, again through our surveillance monitoring system. Uh, we are routinely notified by uh, the surveillance team and GEU of patrons that are given a 24-hour trespass, 30-day uh, eviction, or even possibly after headed by the GEU. The IEB will then in turn review these patrons for possible over service. Our review consists of the patron's time on property, the number of alcoholic beverages they are served, and even which food and beverage employees serve them. Uh, if there's a situation of possible over service, it is discussed immediately with PPC compliance and management. Uh, through these inspections and reviews, the IEB has recorded minimal instances of alcohol related violations and non compliance, non -compliance issues. Uh, any observations, again, are discussed with PPC compliance and are followed up with additional training for their employees. Uh, lastly, uh, the IEB and PPC maintain, maintain a relationship with the Alcohol and Beverages Control Commission. The ABCC routinely conducts unannounced on-site inspections, reporting minimal issues. Uh, in fact, after recently speaking with the ABCC on the matter, they have reported minimal issues not only in the last few years, but also since opening the casino. You know. uh, the ABCC has stated they have no concerns with the renewal of the liquor license at PPC as well. Uh, to close, PPC has been very receptive to our findings and maintains exemplary compliance with regards to alcohol service. Uh, with that, the IEB fully recommends the renewal of PPC's liquor license for all requested outlets. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and good morning. Good morning. Good question, uh, Chair, if I can uh, comment, and uh, thank you, Andrew. And, you know, at the risk of going back to ancient history, uh, just I wanted to give you the uh, a full picture that under the initial license of PPC, remember we're in the first renewal now, you're, you're getting ready to vote on the second renewal. In that period of the first renewal, uh, not surprisingly, there were some storage item issues that uh, PPC had. They did receive a notice of non-compliance and they received a civil administrative penalty for a series of uh, alcohol storage uh, infractions. Those date back to 2015. Um, since that time, uh, and again, that was under the initial license, uh, since that time, uh, you know, errors were corrected and that continued uh, coordination uh, with the gaming agent team and inspections have uh, all been uh, met in a, a satisfactory manner. Questions for, uh, and, and I wanna make sure we get back to questions for Nikisha on the licensing and then on the IEB compliance. So um, I think we can manage both. Um, who would like to wave their hand if you have any questions? I'll set uh, Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner Cameron. 
I'm all set as well, but I do appreciate the compliance um, report and um, I, I'm really, I'm glad to see that they have uh, made those improvements and um, their record has been, has been uh, very strong uh, since the initial um, training issues that I do recall. So thank you for that. Commissioner O'Brien, comments, questions? All set. Yes, and of course, they're on the second, the re we renewed their full gaming license after the five year period. And that, that compliance was of course taken into consideration upon renewal. So as Director Lilios frames, it's, it's somewhat ancient history. I like um, how Andrew framed it, that it's been exemplary compliance. Um, from the start, there were some lessons to be learned. That's okay. All right. Um, but I want to go back to Nikisha. Is there anything else that you need or want to add? Because I know I added a little element of confusion as I figured out the process. Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, can I just confirm, um, if I may, with North, the capacity of uh, the racing apron with that uh, expanded space? Currently, it's, it's, it's at 963. And, you know, if, if that, I would imagine that would be expanded. Um, and so I would ask Madam Chair uh, that we adjust uh, the vote to ac account for that as well. North? Yeah, so um, I do not have a fire rating capacity for that area yet. I'm happy to get it for you, um, Nikisha, if, that, if that's helpful. Um, for that space, but it, it will be an addition of 2,500 square feet. I'm just not sure which formula they'll be using to determine the additional. Um, there, there is quite a bit of space there, as, as you pointed out. So the 963 for the apron, I think, should be more than sufficient. But um, if we need to add additional uh, for the additional square footage, we will. Okay. And so um, with that, Todd and uh, Nikisha, do we? Do we need to manage that in any way uh, subject to um, an expansion of that number? Nikisha? I think we should reference that and in, in, we should reference that in any motion as the, I think the anticipated motion would essentially incorporate the particulars of the application. So we wanna just recognize that that one number will be different. Madam Chair, if I may, we, we're, not, we're not requesting an increase of the capacity. Um, if the fire marshal were to come back and, and to grant additional capacity, we can always um, amend it at a later time. Oh, but the current okay. capacity for this space seems more than sufficient. Okay, so the number that Nikisha was nine something would That's, stand. Yes, 963. Commissioner's no, questions on that? I, Commissioner O'Brien? I did. I just, I'm looking at, I'm trying to figure out what page I'm on. I think it's um, 13. In fact, it's the gaming beverage license information chart. Yeah. We have location, restaurant seats, tables, bar, square footage, that chart. Um, it references number eight as the racing apron. There is no specification in terms of seats and tables. Nikisha, is that acceptable or do we need to be slotting in or putting a placeholder in there? Uh, this is the, the list uh, yeah. that we've that uh, PPC has provided. Because um, you're talking about capacity, but then the others all seem to specify seats and tables, and this doesn't. Is that a requirement, or was that surplusage? I think that's okay. surplusage. It's not. It's not required okay. by the regulations that inf that that information be included in the renewal. Okay. Act. Okay, all right, thank you. Commissioner Cameron? No, question. So knowing now that they're not asking for um, an addition, it will remain at 960. Is there a need to reference that number in the, in the motion? It would seem to me that we wouldn't have to do that. I don't think you would, uh, Commissioner Cameron. Um, the number 963 is listed on the application itself. Um, the renewal application, and that is what uh, you are uh, voting on today, um, with the with the addition of the expanded area. Okay, thank you. 
Any further questions? Well then, if there are no further questions, um, we do need a formal vote. Are, are you prepared, commissioners, to offer one motion? I, I am, I'm happy to make that motion. Great, Commissioner Cameron. Um, I move that the commission review the gaming beverage license issued to Plain Ridge Park Casino subject to the revised drawing of the apron mentioned today in 4A, including all licensed areas described and depicted in the application contained in the commissioner's packet and reviewed today, and incorporating all terms and conditions described in chapter 23K205 CMR and included in the submitted applications for a term of three years ending on June 24th, 2024, in accordance with 205 CMR 136.061. Commissioner, Commissioner yeah. did you say yeah. renewed or review? Yeah, I think we need to say renewed. And maybe if we say renewed, um, effective immediately upon the expiration of the existing license, and then the rest of the language would cover it. But I think if we add that phrase in, then it covers renewing and then having it kick in as soon as the existing one expires. Yeah, if I said reviewed, I meant renewed. <laughs> I thought that's right. I, I couldn't tell myself it. say that. So um, No, it might have been my ears, so thank you. Uh, with that revision, motion stands. Uh, I, I second that motion with those revisions. And Todd, you have that correct, all set. Okay, then I think we can go right ahead with our roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. And Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. I vote yes for zero, Vivian. Thanks so much. Exciting, uh, North. Thank you. Um, and Andrew and Burke. Burke, good morning. Um, Andrew took care of business today. We appreciate your appearance. How are you? Hello, how are you? Yes, Andrew does such a great job. I think Bruce and I uh, welcome the opportunity to uh, allow Andrew to speak. <laughs> That's an excellent job, thank you. And Nikisha, are you all set? I am all set. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, thank you to the IEB and the Gaming Agents Division. Um, as you said, Andrew, thank you. Great job. I also want to uh, send a special thanks to Lisa Bruckner, who is instrumental in getting us across the finish line uh, with preparation of those uh, renewal like those renewal licenses. So, thank thank you, Lisa, and uh, and and. Nice to see you. Do you want, I have to ask, because Lisa has the most interesting background. What's this one? This is um, Essex, Massachusetts, um, dinner on the uh, wharf at a restaurant. It was beautiful that evening. And I you captured it. Mm. You captured it nicely. You get me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lisa, for your good work. And I know that thank PPC you. is very pleased with this outcome. So thank you to all. Takes the whole team. Evidence right here, right? So. Thank you. Um, I think then uh, we can um, move on Mary, to. I'm shocked. Oh, we can move on to item number six. Is that correct? All right. Thank you. So we have Dr. Lightbound. There you are. Good morning, Alex. So uh, we have several. Oh, Lisa, you might want to mute. Thank you so much. So we have. Several um, new people to um, uh, be approved as racing officials today. Uh, one of them, Joe Pastella, um, is going to uh, be uh, photo finish and timing. He's being trained now by Andrew Tavares. Um, Ed Angel has been with the um, track, uh, on the track crew since 2015, and he's being elevated to track superintendent. Um, Wayne Dunphy is um, a, a backup presiding judge. He's had two years as a presiding judge and four years as an associate judge. He does have a USTA presiding judge license. He does not have the racing accreditation program um, certification. Uh, last year, uh, due to the COVID, they did not hold that certification program. And so there is kind of a shortage of judges. Um, and um, there is precedent that we have had backup judges in the past that have not had the full rope accreditation. So um, with his experience and 
the fact that he'll be a backup, I do feel comfortable uh, recommending that he be approved. Uh, Steve O'Toole, the director of racing for Plainage Park Casino, is on um, joining us by phone today if the commissioners have any other questions for him. Good morning, Steve. Questions for Alex. Commissioner Cameron, you want to start? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I recall us uh, making an exception in the past for a backup judge, although we, we do like to follow best practices and require our judges to, um, to be accredited. Um, and certainly we would encourage um, if, if um, Mr. Dunphy were to continue as a backup for years to come, we would encourage um, uh, him to go through that process, which I know is rigorous. But I, I, in, in light of the fact that the course was not offered, I think that this exception is warranted um, in this case. Can I do a follow-up? Um, will, the, will the training be offered this season so that he can take it while in this position, or how does it work? Um, it is being offered in July, and I, I did talk to Steve about that. Um, as uh, Commissioner Cameron mentioned, it is a rigorous program that um, is basically uh, has the person unavailable to do their regular job mm -hmm. for 10 days. Um, so uh, sometimes that inhibits people from doing it if they're actively in a position where they need to be present. Yeah. Okay. And so does that mean that it would be offered off season as well? It might be offered another time of the year. Often they do offer it twice a year, but right now I only see the July dates being offered. Okay. Commissioner O'Brien, you're leaning in. No, oh, you're off. No, no, it was just more reacting to that conundrum of the dates not really being conducive to trying to be able to do it. So yeah, it's a, a not ideal, right? Um, Commissioner Zunica? I'm all set. I'm, yeah. I, I'm going to rely on your judgment, um, Alex, on that. It does seem like a little bit of a catch-22. Yes, unfortunately. Commissioner Cameron? Yeah, I would, I would hope that um, Rope would get back to twice a year accreditation once they um, fully come out of these pandemic circumstances. Okay, great. And we need a vote. If there are no further questions for Alex, Dr. Lightbow. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to uh, move that the Commission approve the following racing officials at Pine Ridge Park Casino in accordance with 205 CMR 3.18. Walter Sullivan Jr. as the Assistant Racing Services Manager, Joseph uh, Pastella as the Racing Supervisor, including photo finish and timing, Ed Angel as the Track Superintendent, and Wayne Dunphy as the Backup Presiding Judge. Second, second that motion. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, no further questions, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zinnica? Aye. I vote yes, 4 0. Thanks, um, to Vivian, and thank you, Dr. Lightbound. And Steve, I know that you're on, um, on phone. Thank you, of course, for, for um, all that you do in North. I think we may have concluded um, at least direct business with PPC as we turn to our budget discussion. Uh, is there anything else that you want to offer to the commission or any questions for North? North? Madam Chair, thank you for taking the time this morning. I know that uh, PPC has taken up a good deal of your morning, uh, but we appreciate you uh, being patient as we get through all of these items and we look forward to the opportunity uh, to continue the record that we've established here in the Commonwealth and to serve our guests and taxpayers. Thank you. Great, and we, we uh, wish you uh, good luck when, when you launch, and we look forward to the, the next quarterly report. So we'll hear, about, we'll hear about the launch. Thank you so much, and again, thank you, Andrew. All right, then I think we can move right on to item number seven, our finance division. Good morning, Derek. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, commissioners. I'm joined today by Agnes Bollier and Doug O'Donnell, 
and on June 3rd, we presented to you the FY22 MGC proposed budget. The materials in the packet today are the exact same materials we presented on June 3rd. Um, as a brief overview, we made the following budget recommendations for fiscal year 2022. A game and control fund budget of 33 million, which includes 27.12 million in regulatory costs and 5.9 million in staff required costs, funding 94 FTEs and three contract positions. A racing budget of 2.65 million in regulatory costs, uh, 209,000 indirect, and funds approximately eight FTEs. A committee mitigation budget funded at 274,500, including two FTEs, and a research responsible gaming budget funded at 6.49 million, including three FTEs, and which is wholly funded by the Public Health Trust Fund. Page two of the memorandum summarizes this information and represents an operational budget of 42.65 million, funding 107 FTEs and three contracted positions. Um, as an overview, the assessment on timing issue came up last time as well. Um, you know, I, I walked through a very complicated explanation of the formula, which is far better summarized in Chapter 23K, Sections 56A through C, as well as our regulation. Um, and that formula is pretty straightforward when you read it, not so easy when I try to describe it. Um, but the tough thing about it is the projection for slot machines and gaming positions, table gaming positions on 7-1 is not straightforward at this period. So we use a projection in the memo, um, page eight of the memorandum, and we'll be using that for the annual slot fee bill, as well as the first quarterly assessment. And then we'll adjust the figures as of July 1 to give actual numbers as to what these actual slot fees were. Um, we also updated you that we're, re we're recommending returning to the billing schedule of slot fees and assessments to pre-COVID timing. We had gone forward and gone on a monthly basis during COVID to provide some, um, a little bit of, leaving, a little bit of um, leeway to the licensees on cash flow. We're going back to quarterly and full year. Um, we said we would post the budget for co public comment, which we did on June 4th. We had asked comments to come back by June 15th at 3 p.m. We're here on June 14th, um, so there's still one more day. I can tell you we haven't received any public comments. I did send an email to all of the uh, CFOs of the licensees letting them know that the deadline would be pushed up and if they could provide any feedback to me that they wanted to. Uh, ahead of time, I did not receive any of that um, for the weekend. I didn't receive any over the weekend. Um, so what, what we are here asking is for you to approve the budget either in the packet as is or if, um, during the last few weeks you've had a little bit of time to review it and wanted to make some comments on it. Um, any of those comments we would address here and approve that budget and we are asking for that contingent upon any additional um, comments coming back at 3 p.m. We bring those comments back to you for consideration at the next public meeting. Derek, just to clarify, you didn't push up the, the date. Uh, you, you indicated to the licensees that we were meeting today. So the actual public comment deadline is what time and what day? Tomorrow? Tomorrow 3 p.m. At which, I'm sorry? 3 p.m. 3 p.m., okay. For some reason, I thought it was Wednesday, so tomorrow, thank you. And this would have worked out um, more, seamlessly, but we moved up Thursday's meeting to today um, in order to ensure virtual capacity. Um, Doug and Agnes, thank you. Do you um, have anything to add in besides a, a hello and a good morning or? Hello and good morning. But um, <laughs> I, I would like to thank the licensees for working with us in this whole process. As Derek had mentioned, um, you know, it's difficult for them to guesstimate what the numbers will be for the slots in the positions on July 1st, which we will make an adjustment, but they, you know, they were very good working with us and getting numbers into us in a timely manner. So I want to thank them for that. Thank you. And, and, and you're reminding all of us that it really is a collaborative, cooperative um, process. Mm -hmm. Agnes, good morning. Good morning. 
No, I have nothing else to add. We, they were very helpful in their comments earlier, and we took those to heart, and we've implemented some of them. And going forward, I think it's a good budget. Great. So, um, Derek invited commissioners, any uh, additional thoughts or reflections you may have had since our review? I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping track of time. It would have been um, just June 3rd, June 3rd. Right. Commissioner Zunica? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, clarify something uh, for, the, for the record, perhaps, and a uh, reminder. Um, so the assessment, just because of this particular year that is so fluid mm -hmm. in terms of gaming positions, the, the assessment of the slot fee will be revised. Actually, the overall assessment will be revised as of the number of gaming positions as of July 1st. And that uh, that slot fee remains the same for for the rest of the year because it's it's on on that time of, a day or on that day of the year. But remind us, Derek. If there was any changes to the gaming positions after July 1st, does the assessment change at any given point, or are we on, on to the next July 1st? No, so we, we come back um, at the mid-year and do a revisit of the gaming positions as of January 1, and then we reassess the second half of the year based on what those revised counts are as of January 1. Great. But the slot fee does not change, right? Is the slot fee is always for the as, as of July first? So we have we have done it that way. You can the statute does allow us to do partial billings for additional machines that come on throughout the year. We haven't done that because um, we haven't had much of a need for it. Those numbers stay pretty consistent once the floor um, is seat, and it's only six hundred dollars prorated per additional months that it's on the floor. Um, so if you go up by 20, it's really not that big of a um, it doesn't make it, yeah. increase or decrease based on the assessments that they're getting of, you know, 20 some odd million dollars. Right. Thank you. Yes, but we can do that. Um, we just haven't implemented it because of the practicality of it. And by the way, by my question, I, I don't mean to imply that we should. Um, I just wanted to clarify. Um, you know the process uh, for for the uh, for the billing and the true up, which only because this particular time there's a lot more reopening and etc. Um, it, it is you know of note worthy um, to to mention that. Commissioners um, Cameron or O'Brien, do you have questions for um, <clears throat> Derek and team? Uh, I do not. I think we we had a uh, a thorough explanation on the third, and um, my questions were answered. And just a thank you to the team. Well done in a trying time. That's right. Same. I don't have any questions at all. Just thank you to everyone for their work. Thank you. And and I agree with with all of that. Um, I I think we stay tuned um, to see how everything evolves um, out of this year. But again, as Commissioner Cameron points out, it was a trying year and the licensees cooperated with our team and our team um, as anticipated stepped right up to the plate. So thank you. All right, so we do So Madam need... Chair, I'll be, I'll be happy to move that the commission approve the fiscal year 2022 budget and associated assessments as outlined in the commissioner's packet and discussed here today, provided that no public comments are received by June 15 uh, at 3 p.m., uh, which is the posted closing time for submission of comments. Second. Thank you. Uh, actually, should we maybe amend that further to say that would require that it come back before us? Because if we get a comment that says, I love it, Okay. Didn't have an impact. Thank you for that, Commissioner. I'll I'll uh, I'll restate. I'll withdraw that motion and restate it again. I move the commission approve the fiscal year 2022 budget and associated amendments, as outlined in the commissioner's packet and discussed today. Provided that no public comments against the budget 
are received by June 15 at 3 p.m. is opposed to closing time for submission of comments. Second. Thanks for that clarifier, Commissioner O'Brien. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. I vote yes. Congratulations to the entire team. We have a budget. Thank you. Or very zero, much. Vivian. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, wow. Well, um, not sure. I'm getting some notice. So it's 11 11. Um, we are running early. Um, we have one more item on our agenda officially Commissioner updates. Does anyone have one? Oh, thank um, you, so Commissioner Zindigan. Well, uh, just a quick one. Um, I attended another uh, one of those uh, virtual conferences that seem to be um, more prevalent these days as a result of the pandemic. This was the SBC digital yeah. conference. I think um, a lot of the uh, panels are going to be available for um, to go back and review. Of, this was not a, a live-only conference. Mark van der Linden was, was part of a panel there, uh, along with uh, Keith White and other people in the responsible gaming world. Uh, this uh, free conference, free for register, register conference, I'm sure was very well attended. And there's a lot of um, a talk and discussion about all the activity around surrounding sports betting and online gaming in the United States and the examples of Europe um, and, and other jurisdictions. Um, I took a couple of um, comments that I felt not worthy, um, and that is uh, the notion that the U.S. has a really good opportunity to do, um, to get the best practices, um, uh, especially compared to Europe, um, in this convergence of uh, sports betting and online, um, from the standpoint that uh, when Europe uh, uh, approved sport bet, sports betting um, 20 years plus ago, a lot of the regulations, it doesn't necessarily contemplate the online space that developed rather quickly after that and that have had to do some um, uh, you know, adjustment, needless to say, as a result of that. Um, so uh, a little bit like the, the same thing that happened in a way to Massachusetts um, when, we, when they approved uh, casino gaming here and we were able to take best practices for, from other jurisdictions a lot of what the Gaming Act in fact already did, and we only continued, uh, is perhaps manifesting itself as well um, with jurisdictions across the United States, uh, taking examples from Europe. So I think uh, there were a lot of great discussions, a sense of a lot of market new entrants, new, new entrants into this market, a lot of excitement around the country in terms of uh, opportunity, but also with that, uh, responsibility to implement things carefully and and, um, uh, and thoughtfully. Thank you. Yeah, um, it, it was an honor for Mark to be invited to that conference. I didn't get to attend his particular segment. I'm glad that you reminded me it's recorded, Enrique, so I should be able to revisit that. But again, congratulations to Director Van der Linden for being invited to that that. Um, comprehensive virtual conference. Any other updates? Well, I'll tell you during this time, the, the storm has come and gone, at least where I'm sitting. So um, whoever's on the other side, me, oh, I, Eileen, you're looking kind of bright outside still. So yeah, well, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day. We do have the, um, um, the gaming policy advisory committee meeting at one. I think that that's quite public. If you need an invitation, if you wish to attend, Jill would be able to forward that to you. Um, the presentations from the team, starting with Loretta, will be interesting. And they'll get to hear also um, Caitlin's presentation on the federal legislation with respect to tribal matters. I mean, I'm sorry, litigation and legislation on respect to tribal matters. And uh, Alex will give her presentation on the, the, uh, the Federal Act on Integrity 
uh, Commissioner Cameron. So I think that the committee members are in for a treat uh, this afternoon, but our team will be hard at work. All right, so with that, again, everyone, thank you so much. Um, stay tuned as to our next meeting uh, and, and, and the format of our next meeting. We'll be seeing what happens um, with respect to uh, any legislative change or interim legislative, legislative change. And uh, we'll be uh, figuring out our schedule going forward. I have to thank you, uh, commissioners, for being so willing to, to meet this morning um, at such short notice. I think it worked out well. Thanks so much. With that, um, I move, move to, to adjourn. adjourn. Well, I second that. Uh, launched right in there. Great. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. That makes four zero. Thank you. Um, have a good day, everyone.